Uh, this afternoon I'm going to talk to you about what I think is the most Lincolnshire thing at the show, Lincolnshire Stuffed Chai. So how many people have heard of Lincolnshire Stuffed Chai? Three, four, five, six. That's not too bad. So it's something that's totally unique to Lincolnshire and you find nowhere else on the planet. There's things very similar, uh, like in France there's a pâté that they make uh, called jambon persil, which is a similar idea with ham and parsley, but nothing at all like chai. So before I start, I don't suppose anybody's got an olive for this, have they? <laughs> I'm told apparently they're only short of glasses, so I've had to make do with this, but I promise it is water. And don't tell, whatever you do, if you go to the stand afterwards, do not tell them that I was drinking out of a martini glass on stage. <laughs> so, stuffed chine is a unique cut that came about because in Lincolnshire we butchered our pigs totally different to how they did in uh, the other parts of the country. And this is thought to have come about because we had our own unique breed of pig called the Lincolnshire Curly Coat. Now, curly coat pigs grew to a big size, 40, 50 stone in weight, and they carried a lot of fat. This pig that we've got here is just a crossbred rare breed pig, so it's not, it's not carrying ever so much fat here on the back. A curly coat would carry fat to this sort of depth. Well, traditionally in the UK, we split a pig straight down the middle, so you have two halves. But on a curly coat, this was a little bit more difficult because they got to get through all this fat and supposedly after it had been hung on a frosty evening from the apple tree, it set up quite firm and it was a bit hard going. So being true Lincolnshire people like we are, be using innovation and finding the easy way around it, legend has it that they decided instead of splitting the pig straight down the middle here, that it'd be much easier to cut through the little rib bones that are only the size of a little finger rather than this great big solid bone. So they cut either side of the backbone and created three pieces of the pig. So you had one side, the other side, and this middle piece in here. So I'll start by removing the chine from this front of the pig, who's got the job of being my glamorous assistant for the day. So this is a full front of the pig, totally unsplit, because obviously if we cut down the middle here, this would ruin our joint that we want. So I'll start by taking the trotters off. So we just cut through these. And something that I'm very passionate about at Meridian Meats is using up everything from the animal. I think it's really important to respect this was an animal and by using everything up and wasting nothing that that's the ultimate way of doing it so things like the trotters we'll save those and boil those up and make those into pork pie jelly for jelly and pork pies things like the pig's ears we sell for people to have dog for their dogs and the heads we remove the cheeks because that's a very select cut now the cheek out the middle and the rest of it we tend to sell for people who make brawn or sometimes we make our own brawn in-house. So once I've taken the trotters off, hopefully if we can get on the right direction here, I'm going to remove the head. So I go in behind the ears and right the way across. <laughs> Do you know what? I did once upon a time think, I was, I was actually just saying to the engineer chappy down here. With this screen here, I can see what's going on the same as your side. It's a bit like keyhole surgery. I could work by looking at the screen. I did quite fancy the idea of being a surgeon once, but it dawned on me that I'm very good at taking things to bits, but it's putting them back together that's the problem. So what I'm doing is heading down to the backbone because I want to remove the head from the rest of it nice and cleanly. So I'm finding the joint, excuse the cracking, that's only my wrist, <laughs> and go through the joint, and then I haven't had to use the saw at all. So minimal effort, straight the way through. If I slide that back now that I've broken it over the edge, you can see here is the neck joint that I've just broken. So I'll cut through there, and we'll remove the head. 
I'll just pop it out of the way. <laughs> Keeping an eye on me. So now we're left with the shoulders each side and the backbone down the middle. And you can see now both ends of the backbone right the way through. So now we need to remove the chine and for this part I need the saw and as I said I'm going to go through the little rib bones either side of the spine. So we'll just start the saw off. And I asked them yesterday at the shop because we've got a whole team of staff at the shop who have been absolutely flat out preparing stuff for the show. And uh, yesterday we were getting the van all loaded up, all the pies and everything loaded on. And I remembered I needed to put on the front of pork and some tools and equipment for doing this demonstration and asked them to find me a saw and everything. And I think bless them as a bit of a practical joke. They've picked me on with a blunt blade in it. So I've gone through one side and I'm now going through the other side. And we just go through the bone no further. It's really important in butchery, especially in craft butchery, to use tools appropriately. So a saw is for sawing and a knife is for cutting. And it's important when we dismantle the carcass to take it to pieces properly so we just cut through the bone and no further and when we get to the meat we move back onto a knife. So now you can see hopefully on the screen I've made two cuts either side. There's a natural seam as we call it which is the layers between the muscles and what I'm going to do is enter this seam just here so you can see it just opening up here that way I'm not cutting into a muscle I'm going between them it produces less waste and does a neater job so I'm following this seam down and almost butterflying the front of the pig like so and I'll do the same on this side So just following that seam to butterfly it out. And now you can see how we're starting to get three pieces. So we follow this right the way down. And just here is the shoulder blade, which I'm just skimming across the top of. The same on the other side. That's my marker that I've gone far enough down. Now traditionally when they did this on a curly coat, they wouldn't have had the luxury of doing it in a piece like this. They would do it down the whole carcass. So it would have been a little bit more difficult. So we go right the way down. And you can see now I've hit the layer of fat and the skin. So I'm about to come through the other side. I take my knife right the way through to release that shoulder from the side of the pig. So here we have a shoulder missing this middle muscle. And this would have been cured for bacon or fat bacon and it would have been the whole side. So we'll move this out of the way. Well, now we use this for sausage making. Uh, combined with belly pork, it has the right amount of lean and fat to give you a nice tasty sausage. So we repeat the same, exactly the same process on this side, right the way down, following the seam. down to the layer of fat and through the skin like so and remove this out of the way. So now we're left with the chine which you can see is quite actually quite a hefty piece of meat now that it's out and this would have run right the way from the head all the way down to the tail. Now we just take out the front chine which would have been referred to as the christening chine and the rest of it we use for pork chops, short back bacon, all those other things that you associate with the loin. And the loin joins on here. So you'll see this familiar shape of a pork chop because the next cut come off here is where your pork chops and your bacon come from. Now, when the chine first came about, like lots of products like bacon and ham, 
there was no refrigeration and they had to come up with a way of preserving this for a future date without refrigeration and the trick was to cure everything. Now by curing what we mean is to turn this from fresh meat into a cured product like ham, bacon, salami and we do that with a mixture of sea salt and uh, saltpetre and some brown sugar and we use a little bit of honey as well in our cure and that's then left this is immersed in a brine made up of that and a brine is a salty solution so we put that salt into some water about 20 percent solution mix it up this chine then gets immersed in that solution for about five weeks after that five week period we then remove it from the brine tank or the wet cure and we hang it up in the fridge and allow it then to dry out. Now traditionally this period of drying out would have been weeks or months, much like you would do with a parma ham. Now if you think about a parma ham when you've seen them, the whole joints on the television, they're totally encased in rind. There's just a small area on the inside of the leg that isn't, but the rest of it is all protected by this rind. Now, if we go back to pre-refrigeration, and this was hanging in the cellar or out in the shed or somewhere cold in the dairy, the ham and the chine and everything else hanging up would have all started to grow a bit of fluff and a bit of fur and a bit of slime on the outside because that's a natural process with this. On a ham, you can just shave it off like this and away you go and you can use it. On the chine, the sides are all three at the sides are all totally exposed to the elements so that means anything that grows on here is sort of growing on the face edge of the meat you can't just shave it off it's a bit difficult to wash it off and legend has it that this they've hung this china up and the next door neighbor had put their pig away as we call it in lincolnshire and done the same and so on throughout the village hung them all up and forgot about them and then when it came around to the sort of springtime and they were using everything up they had been looking at this chine hanging away and it had been getting furrier and furrier and furrier and looking less and less appetizing of which i know this is not selling the product but promise me it tastes brilliant and thought i don't know what we're going to do we can't waste it because we all know then food was not wasted in the way that it is now so they hooked it down scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed at it with a brush and a bit of cold water to clean it off and went in the garden and looked for something strong tasting that they could rub on it or stuff into it to take away the flavour of how we'd describe as a reasty flavour or a sort of rancid flavour. And what was growing in the garlic, uh, in the what, what was growing in the garden, but parsley, which we have here. Oh, sorry, <laughs> you beat me to it. So here we have fresh parsley. So they took the parsley, somebody had chopped it up, scored some marks into this chine, stuffed it in, wrapped it in a bed sheet, which you'll be pleased to know we don't do anymore. <laughs> Dropped it in a copper, which is a big vat of boiling water, which every house used to have. And out it came, and there was this product that was totally different, carved it in, actually it tasted all right. And the story goes, that that person then said to the neighbour, have you still got your chine hanging? Because if you have, I've got a good idea of how you, how you can make it taste a bit better. And so on and so on, and this was passed across and the chine was born. And from there it's grown as a very traditional Lincolnshire product, uh, which you don't see anywhere else in the country or anywhere else in the world. And it's been passed down from generation to generation. There's very little written about it. It's all been spread word of mouth from one person to another, teaching and training and explaining. So this chine then would go into its brine solution, as I said, for five weeks. So we'll move this out of the way. And here in true Blue Peter fashion, here's one I prepared earlier. This one, has been curing for five weeks and then has had a week and a half hanging on the wall side in our fridge to dry out. Now one of the first thing you'll see on here compared to the fresh chine is how it's firmed up. It's gone really firm because the way that we cure is very old fashioned. Even though it goes into a wet cure with water, 
the salt pulls out the moisture. So the water takes the salt into the middle of the meat and then the salt then forces the moisture back out. So that's why this chine firms up because it, lots of the moisture has come out of it. Then we hang it up and that allows even more to come out. So it's turned a pinky colour, it's firmed up and it's now ready, you can see how the rind has softened, it's ready to make the scores into it that we're going to put the parsley into. So to do this we use just a normal bone-in knife and we go in to the fat and this is very important, this was something that was drummed into me when I was training, was you make sure you go into the fat so that the stripes of green go all the way across. So we go in and all the way down to the bone in the middle. Now you see my knife won't go any further, that's because here we have a bone. This means the chine has got two sides, so we go all the way down and do one side. And it's a bit of a standing joke with one of the lads that works for us, because one year at the Lincolnshire show, we were busy carving away chines because we do um, stuffed chine rolls, which is a really traditional way to eat it, just in a nice white bread roll. And I was carving away at a chine, cooked a chine on the uh, counter, went to turn it over to get to the other side, and it was all scored, but there was no parsley in it. And he'd forgotten to turn it over and stuff it. So we had half a stuffed chine and half effectively as ham. So you'll see I'm working all the way across and I'm putting a sort of thumb's width between my cuts. Again, into the fat, right back to the backbone, opening it. And you can see when you look in the slit how pink it is from the curing process. So it's pink like bacon or ham. So we're almost done on one side. And in tradition of that China the Lincolnshire show, I'm only going to do one side on this. It's quite a long job doing both sides and I don't want anybody falling asleep. So that's one side totally scored. So you'll see all the little pockets there ready for having some stuff in it. So the next job is to put the parsley into here. This is the bit everybody hates doing because firstly parsley sticks to everything and secondly because we do this all year round we have to take fresh parsley chop it and freeze it so we have a ready supply all the time so usually today i've got the joy of this actually being at about fridge temperature of about three degrees normally it's about minus 18 so i'm sure everybody can remember the feeling of your fingertips when you've been snowball fighting when you were little it's very similar so I'll put sharp implements out of the way and bring my parsley across. We use a scoop for this because it helps it drop in a bit better. And I'm going to put a glove on because as I said, parsley goes everywhere. And it tends to be very cold down in the pockets of this chine because as well as the parsley being usually at minus 18, the chine has been in a brine tank which although it's in the fridge running at about zero degrees, it's usually sitting at minus something, but if it's in there for so long, it keeps chilling. So hopefully if I can get this on. <laughs> right. So we take a scoop of the parsley and we open up one of these pockets and drop the parsley in and push it right down. Now it's really, really important to push it right down to the bottom of the slip because we want green all the way down. You don't want green parsley at the top and you get halfway down and the customer's getting no parsley because that doesn't go down very well. And that is another interesting thing really. We had uh, somebody once come into the shop and they said, why is it that when I come and shop in a little shop, everything is always so good. And when I go to a supermarket or a bigger shop, sometimes things aren't so good and my answer very truthfully to them was because I'm stood here behind the counter and if something's wrong it's me that gets it in the neck directly I'm the one who gets the ticking off and nobody likes being told off or complained to so that means you up your standards and you make sure that everything that goes out you're happy with so that nobody should come back and complain and that's the same with this, because we're stuffing 
these chines and we're serving them to people. If we get halfway down and somebody's getting slices with no parsley in and they're not happy, they'll tell us about it. And uh, that encourages you to do a good job, which I think is a good thing. Because our customers are our biggest critics and we want them to be happy all the time. We want them to come back. We want them to enjoy what they buy because we enjoy making it. And that's what got me into this job in the first place was the passion and enjoyment of doing it. It's, you're very lucky, I think, if you get up in the morning and enjoy what you do when you go to work. Because if you do, you're never really going to work. So you can see I'm working right the way across this chine, pushing this right into these pockets. And it's starting to resemble what we recognise as chine. We've just got a couple more pockets left to stuff in here. And when we do the Lincolnshire show, because the backbone of our business here is doing stuffed chine in bread rolls or stuffed chine for people to take home, we have to do no end of these the previous week running up to now, so that we have 30 or 40 of these to stuff and cook in the week before we come to the Lincolnshire show. So as you can imagine, that's quite a lengthy process and quite time consuming. So that is now stuffed. I've just checked down and put a little bit in anywhere that doesn't look quite right. And you can see now we're getting the beautiful colours of the pink and the green together. We scrape off any excess and then you can see on there the stripes. So now we've turned it into something a little bit more special looking. So once we've done this Ordinarily, obviously, we do the other side, then we need to cook it. Now, as I said, traditionally, this is wrapped in a bed sheet. But firstly, we need a lot of bed sheets, and secondly, environmental health, we really don't like us using them. So now we use a special bag, which is a cooking bag. This is very similar to a roasting bag that you would buy uh, for cooking at home, but just on a bigger scale. And what happens is this does exactly the same thing as the bed sheet. It holds it all together. It keeps the parsley in there, keeps all the juiciness and the stock in there, and it protects it whilst it's cooking. So we put this into this bag, hopefully without making too much of a mess, because these poor guys are going to have to clean up after. <laughs> I'm supposed to be on tomorrow, but by the time I've finished, they might not let me back. So we slide that into the cooking bag. And we pull this tight and twist it round and then tie it up with a piece of string and that's then ready for cooking. And this then goes into a water bath which is our modern version of a copper and is cooked at about 90 degrees Celsius for eight to eight and a half hours which is quite a long time um, but it's cooked nice and steady to keep the juiciness in there. So I'll just move this out of the way and brush that parsley up a little bit and we'll move on to the cooked product. Waste not one lot. So we'll get rid of this. And if you excuse me two seconds, I'm just going to wash my hands before we move on to the cooked. So if anybody's gone, I know you'd miss it. So, after eight to eight and a half hours cooking, we then submerge it into cold water because we want to get it cold as quickly as possible for hygiene reasons. We want to get it down for its cooking temperature to fridge temperature below eight degrees as quickly as we can. So we do that by running it through cold water first before we then put it into refrigeration. So, 
Once it's finished cooking and cooling, we're left with the chine encased in one of those bags in a cocoon of jelly. So we then remove the jelly, remove any of the lard that's rendered out of it whilst cooking, and we're left with the chine, as you can see. So you can see the pink is now very vibrant because it's cooked, and the green has dulled off slightly, and you'll notice we're looking straight down on it. So I'll have a bit more of my martini. <laughs> So, because, as you'll remember, we have the backbone through the middle of this chine, and it has two sides, this then means it's very difficult to carve. Also, we've got these beautiful stripes, we want to preserve those into the slice, you don't want to be cut in this way so you can't see them. And it also means with this bone in here, we can't put it on a machine. So if you ever see anybody carving stuffed chine on an electric slicer, it's not stuffed chine. It's stuffed collar, but it's not stuffed chine because it must have this bone running through the middle, so it has to be carved by hand for it to be chine. I have realised I haven't got a plate. Have you guys got a plate? I thought I was doing quite well that I've remembered everything by that point, but. Brilliant, thank you. So, I'll put that here to carve some off because I'm sure. Well, I hope after that everybody in France is trying a bit. So, the bread roll. <laughs> they've got plenty over there. Anyway, incidentally, I've heard the traffic is horrendous, so I'd recommend everybody gets a chine roll to eat in the car on the way home. <laughs> so, we carve across the chine, so you should be able to hopefully see on there how I'm carving across. Now, I'm sure it's something that um, you I haven't necessarily seen until recently, but now more people on television and in delicatessens and things you'll see carving palm hand by hand. They carve it very similarly because there's a bone in there, they have to carve it by hand and they have to carve it across it. So this is how we go right the way across. And again, this is a knack in its own right. And many a time when I was training, there's only one way to train how to carve stuff chine and that's in the shop in front of a customer and we all know it's really difficult when you've got an audience and there's many a time that I've got a ticking off or told how to do it that I was doing it wrong when I was busy carving off chunks of chine instead of slices but on the plus side you soon learn to get the knack of it and if you haven't grasped how to do it by the time we've finished the literature show you're well and truly fully fledged so you see now how we're getting lovely slices coming off there and you can see on this chine a little bit of moisture sitting on the top that's because of the gentle cooking we haven't dried it out because we don't want it to be overcooked because overcooked chine or ham just breaks up like a rotten log and it's not very pleasurable to eat we want it to still just be slightly moist and nice and juicy so that you get all the fresh flavors of the cured meat and the parsley so i'll cut another slice off here you can see how the parsley is, keeps going in all the slices and that should keep going all the way down to this middle bone and once we get here we then turn it over and carve the other side all the way down so that all we're left with is a bone that's a bit like a Tom and Jerry fish bone but when they fish one out of the bin just the ribs and the spinal column running down the back of it which incidentally makes the most amazing pea and ham soup if any of you wish chefs one of a chine bone boiled up is absolutely fantastic and their bargain has only two quid so i'll move this chine just to one side I'll pop those over there does anybody know what you get if you've got three trotters a yard of pork three feet so i'll cut this up into some little strips and pop it up here and you're all more than welcome at the end to come and try a little bit. Traditionally it's eaten with a little splash of malt vinegar, which again I've also forgotten because they've got it across on the stand. But please feel free to pop over there. We've got tasters there as well. Uh, and we have got vinegar over there if you want to try it on them. And traditionally it's eaten just as you would ham with a salad, some nice uh, salad and potatoes, some local potatoes, or as we're doing at the show here in a stuffed chine roll, 
whereas in just in a bread bun, and my preference is for a little wiping of uh, English mustard and a little splash of malt vinegar, and I think it really takes some beating, that does. And to me, it's one of the things that is absolutely key to the show. I think you can't come to the Lincolnshire show and not try a bit of stuffed chine, really, because it is the most Lincolnshire thing at the show, other than the Lincoln Red. So that's all cut up into little bits, and you can come up and try it. And if anybody has any questions at all, please feel free to ask, even if they're not related to chine, but are somehow related to me, uh, I'm happy to answer them as well. Uh, that, that about computer. Thank you.